Yeah, thank you. Uh, I feel like this is the undercard of the uh, presidential debate or something. So No, not at all. <laughs> Anyways, I, I appreciate you doing this and, and holding this hearing. It's, like Catherine says, it's very informative. I wanted to say I'm a family member. My older sister, Elena, had developmental disabilities. And uh, back in 1971, when I was still in high school, my parents, uh, when she was aging out of special ed, my parents asked me to go up to Agnews. We lived in Monterey because the two programs in the Monterey area had waiting lists, and that's all they had. And they were told that Ag News would be the best place for my sister. I went up there, uh, and I checked it out. It's about 65, 70 miles away from my home. And I just didn't, I went back to my parents and just said it wasn't the right place for her. It seemed far, it was huge. And it wasn't a philosophical reason, it wasn't about congregate settings or anything like that, because I didn't know about those things. It was simply, it was too far away. She lived with us, we did everything together. She would miss us and we would miss her. And so I just said she needed to stay. But it was a quirk of fate. She could have been a developmental center resident and my family and I would have been on, quote, the other side. When she died, in 2003, as we were fighting against massive cuts here at the state capitol, I realized that there isn't another side, that we're all on the same side. And that realization, I think, is very important as we move forward towards change. You know, many of the families and all of us, whether you're in D.C. or the, in the community, We've seen the near destruction of, our, of critical services and supports over the years due to budget shortfalls and uncertain economy and the Great Recession. And understanding any of that doesn't and shouldn't lessen anyone's worries or fears and concerns. They're real. And this is about people who are living now in the DCs and their families. And many of them are doing well now, so they say. And it's a simple human desire to wish and hope that that continues for the person they care about and love. That is what my own family would have wanted for my sister. Two minutes, sir. But it doesn't mean that, there isn't, that we can fight change and change is coming. So what is needed is this. Oversight and needed resources and funding to ensure, to the regional centers to ensure as much as possible that it is done at every level with good reporting data, transparency, outcomes, and action. Number two, continued oversight by this committee and the budget subcommittees, not just to review the same problems over and over, but to make sure problems are resolved, issues are addressed, and to review outcomes. Number three, funding for a crisis response team for movers and for others beyond the one-year mark. Number four, we should approach transition and change in a person-centered way so that we are talking about people. For instance, you should talk about the closure of the residential homes. We should be talking about where did those people go. Number five, we should be talking about outcomes and looking at the developmental services funding bill and look at the major significant outcomes and reporting that are part of that bill. It is amazing. For the first time, we will have documentation of all the direct care workers who work in our system that we've never had before. And finally, the community-based system is going through massive changes through requirements of the home and community-based services rules, and it's going to require our community to come together and transition. And that transition should be open, transparent, and should reflect the diversity of our community and the unmet needs of our community that people um, are not getting services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moto. Thank you so much. What was your sister's name? Elena. Thank you for asking. Appreciate that. Thank you for telling us about Elena as well and your personal story. Is it okay if you just hang here for a little bit until we go through the panel? Uh, and I think you're absolutely right that we need to be talking about the people and not the homes. So I, I appreciate you making that clarification. So thank you so much. I um, would like to be able to turn to Mr. Anderson. He's the executive director of the ARC California. He's going to be talking about some success stories about people moving into the community, and the importance of doing it right, and ensuring that parents are given a voice. Thank you so much for being here with us, and I really appreciate your patience today. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so, Tony Anderson, I'm the executive director of the ARC of California, but I also represent United Cerebral Palsy in a collaboration in the state. And if you've heard the rumors that I was the Lanterman Coalition chair, I'm not speaking for them, but you know, wow. Hey, and again, thank you for everything that that uh, 
that has happened in this in this um, in this house and the other house and both parties. Um, the attention that um, our legislators have been paying to the issues important to people with developmental disabilities is um, is is heartwarming and is very important for us and and it's a and it's a great beginning for us. So thank you for that and keep knocking on that wood. Hey, there us. we go. Absolutely. Uh, and I do want to join you, uh, Senator McGuire um, and uh, and Senator Mitchell, in thanking um, Secretary Dooley um, for the work that she did do in the task force. That is unprecedented. The kind of attention that she's played. Uh, the, the role that she's played is um, unprecedented. I don't remember other secretaries um, playing that type of an active role in this issue. So uh, that has been uh, incredible for us, and that's a good sign. Um, and 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 of course the department. And and I and I have to say, um, um, in, in particular, John Doyle, who was here all day, and, and uh, he did a great job. And um, our, our condolences to him. He's he had a, a loss in the family, and this is about family as well. This is the underlying um, issue here is family, uh, uh, in addition to people. And uh, so I, I just need to say that as well because that's important to all of us, right? Thank you. Um, and we the arc we've had a historic. Um, opposition to developmental centers um, that we've always felt that people, uh, not always, but for many years, we felt that people should be living in the community with anybody else, and um, and, I, and that's not an, a new idea. Um, there's no state in this country right now that would build a developmental center and to provide services for people with, with developmental disabilities. That idea is is gone, and uh, and we have moved forward, but um, but that's not to um, to say that the concerns are not legitimate because you know we we come to you on a regular basis and we tell you about what's happening in our community and we've had we've had great partnerships uh, Carol, Senator Lou uh, helped us out with some bills about criminal justice. You know, we know that people are victimized at a much higher rate than any other group. Uh, we also know that people when they're in the criminal justice system uh, uh, don't do very well, and we come to you and we ask you to, to make sure that there is fair justice and the people are not railroaded, and that there's also services and supports for people who find themselves in the in the criminal justice system. Transportation, you know, we're constantly at, at your at your step your door and asking you, or please, you know, to improve the services that are in place so that people can have real lives and not be, you know, shuttered into their, in their homes. The health care issues that, that uh, Kathleen Miller talked about, uh, she and I have uh, partnered on, on that particular issue, the needs of people with, with uh, severe health needs, and also that they get the right kind of health care and access in, into the hospitals that they need. And, um, you know, there's a huge area, the, the housing you've heard about, and we, we are going to continue to be pushing, please help. We need access to places for people to live. So all of those things are real. Those are all legitimate concerns that people have about, you know, what's happening next for people with developmental disabilities in the institutions and when they move out. And uh, we're going to all continue to push on all those things and many, many more. We have a whole list, and you know you'll see us. But we don't ask you to then, therefore, <coughs> hide people away or, or protect us under some kind of a protective coding or anything of that nature. We ask you to, to work with us to be bold and push societies and push entities and parts of government to, to better respond to the needs of people with developmental disabilities, because they're often not seen. It's a small part of the population and, and not seen. So uh, that's that's our answer, that we'll continue to push on you as well as ourselves and uh, and our colleagues, that we improve in every one of those areas and that we, we know that this is hard. And nobody is saying that this is just an easy thing. You had mentioned earlier about a haphazard approach. We are completely with you. We do not want a haphazard approach. We need a comprehensive person-centered plan. When Ray was talking about the person-centered plan for the IPP, we are completely there. We think that each individual needs to make sure that it's done in the way CMS has, has laid out some really good rules on the way it should be done. And they have said that, you know, you've got to make sure the people in their life that care about them are involved and that they have real, real access and real exposure to all the community services that might serve them and support them. And you continue to do that in a very comprehensive way. You can't move forward without that. So we think those are the rules. And we completely support that. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, you do too, so we could talk about that more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Can I just have, you have about another minute, sir? Uh, I thought I was going to get you to ask me a question. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, but I did, what I did want to share with you, and uh, you mentioned it about the success stories, and I, I just had to uh, um, make a few reports for you. I've asked a lot of my colleagues around the state to send me some of their success stories, and that's what I've left for you. Packets, there's pictures where people have given us permission to give pictures, and, uh, and a little story about each person, and what you'll find in, in each one of them is that somebody at some point along the way has given up on these people, right? On people with developmental disabilities, somewhere in the report it says that they are, um, they're not going to ever work. They're, they're not, they're a danger to themselves. They'll never be able to, to integrate and those kinds of things. And then the other part of each one of these stories is that this person now either works in a job, uh, volunteers at a place, um, has gotten married and has been married by uh, an incredible senator that we all know about. And um, th those things happen. People get married by senators. And, um, and, and yet they were in jail at different points. They were, they were removed from society and now they're active individuals. And that's, that's just sort of a general overview of what all these stories will tell you. Um, I will tell you that uh, Bob Guthrie from San Diego He's an older gentleman now, but if you get a chance to meet Bob, he was in institutions for uh, quite a long time. And he will, um, after he gets, when he's done being teary-eyed, uh, because he is so grateful for his life and what, what he is able to do, his advocacy, and then just being a contributor, um, it, will, it will touch you, it'll move you, and all of these individuals, you, you get a chance to, to meet them, and you'll know that um, none of us should ever be given up on, right? And um, there's great potential, but it's not, I'm not saying it's easy. And that's, the, that's the point here, but we're all working on this together. And but we- I um, uh, ask you to conclude, I apologize. No, no problem. <laughs> and uh, just to conclude, we appreciate the administration's bold move and bold proposal for the closure. And, um, and we wanted to see it done the correct way as well. And we'll do everything we can in our part to, to make sure that happens. No, thank you so much, Tony. And again, thank you so much for being here and for being with us for so long today. Really grateful for all your work. You're welcome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now a pleasure to be able to introduce Rod Stroud. He is a Special Projects Director within Health Services at the County of Sonoma. He's going to be sharing the work that the county has been doing uh, with the STC Coalition to really transform the Sonoma Developmental Center site, uh, focusing on the federally qualified health center, an equi equipment resource and information center, as well as an acute crisis center. Mr. Stroud, thank you so much for your patience today. We're grateful that you're here and you have five minutes, sir. It's good to see you. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Senator uh, McGuire and Senator Mitchell and the committee members. Uh, my name is Rod Stroud. I'm the Special Projects uh, Director uh, with the Sonoma County Department of Health Services. I'm here today on behalf of the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors. Supervisor Gorin, whose district includes the SDC, sends her regrets that she could not be here today. Uh, but thanks the Senators for holding this hearing on a topic of such high importance to Sonoma County and the rest of the state. Uh, the closure plan submitted by DDS established as its highest priority the health and safety of the SDC residents with a promise to the people of the state of California, to the families and to the residents that no residents would be moved from the SDC until appropriate services are available in the community. Today I'd like to describe for you the county's support for a health disability resource center that would provide a continuation of three core services, an FQHC, an equipment resource and income center, and an acute crisis center. A uh, first, a key component of the HDRC will be the development of an H FQHC focused on the specialized needs of the developmentally disabled individuals. Uh, the FQHC will provide the full array of primary care services, dental services, behavioral health services, and much needed preventative care. The FQHC will be operated by an existing Sonoma County nonprofit uh, FQHC, either as a satellite or as a standalone clinic. The county has retained the consulting firm, a Pacific Health Consulting Group, to prepare a feasibility and sustainability plan. Uh, the county has already held meetings with the Sonoma County FQHCs, um, who have expressed significant interest, significant interest in developing such a clinic. The county has met with the Achievable Clinic, an FQHC in Southern California, 
that works closely with the West Side Regional Center and focuses in on the developmentally disabled. Uh, the county met with Achievable, or the county arranged for the Achievable to meet with the Sonoma County Clinics, um, base clinics, and to provide them information on establishing a similar clinic in Sonoma County. Similar to the experience of Achievable Clinic, uh, to support the financial sustainability of such a clinic, the clinic will need to negotiate with the state an enhanced rate in relief from the productivity requirements. Uh, regarding staffing the clinic, while trust is an important component in any individual's relationship with their doc doctor, the patients with IDD, it is even more critical, takes longer to establish. For this reason, it is important that the FQHC includes staff from the SDC. In discussions with the FQHCs, the local Sonoma County FQHCs, they've expressed inter interest in retaining staff uh, in their clinics. A second component of the HDRC will be the development of an equipment, resource, and information center. The center will serve three main functions and work closely with and be operationally linked with the regional center. Most importantly, it will act as an information hub that will allow for coordination of services across the full continuum of the client's medical and behavioral services and support. Providers, clients, families and other parties involved, involved in providing care to the disabled client will have access to a common set of data. In addition to acting as an information hub, the center will provide life skills training and education similar to the services that are currently provided on the SDC site. The center will include a navigator function that will work closely with and integrate with the regional center to assist clients. Uh, educating, assist clients in educating them and linking them with appropriate services. Strategy right, of two minutes. Thank you. Uh, finally, the center will include a unit specializing in durable repair of durable medical equipment. The SEC currently employs a number of technicians with specific expertise in adapting and repairing specialized equipment. For this reason, it is critical that we retain those services. The third component of the HDRC will be expansion of the existing acute crisis center from the current five beds to 15 to 20 beds. Utilization in waiting lists have demonstrated the need for this expansion. The Acute Crisis Center will continue to provide emergency and other necessary services for clients in the community who are in need of short-term transitional crisis services. This will not only deflect individuals from more expensive alternatives, but assist them in returning and exceed, succeeding in the community setting. In conclusion, the county looks forward to working with all parties to build this system of care coming together, building strategic partnerships, planning, sitting down at the table together to look at critical pathways and, and next steps, ensuring a system of care is in place for the SDC residents as their transition to the community is a commitment that is articulated throughout the state's closure plan. It's unanimously been voiced in every public meeting. It's steadfastly been supported by the county and the SDC coalition, and most importantly, it is a, it is a commitment that we all share. Uh, the development of a health disability resource center does not run counter to that commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Stroud. I appreciate you representing uh, Supervisor Gorin, who has just been a, a tremendous advocate, uh, tireless. Uh, and now that she is uh, giving a presentation to the National Association of Counties, why she couldn't be here, so she apologized, but great job today. Would like to be able to open it up to the senators to see if there are any questions or comments that any of you may have. Senator Mitchell. Thank you very much. Let me start, uh, Mr. Stroud. Um, the Health Development Resource Center, it's an amazing commitment that the county has made. My question is, um, are you exclusively looking at using Sonoma property? <laughs> Uh, no, no. Devel Sonoma Development Center property? Yeah, um, no, we're not. We're in the process of really assessing that, especially mm -hmm. with regards to the clinic. That is one of the issues mm -hmm. that we're looking at with regards to the, the, the um, DD-focused FQHC, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it would be on the Sonoma property or another property. We really have to look at that from a sustainability issue. I would agree, as well as a licensure, licensure issue, because when, as a, as from the budget perspective, recognizing the number of units that um, are no longer receiving federal dollars because of their, quite frankly, inadequacy, I would be concerned if you were only looking at um, the development center property um, for this really unique opportunity. Um, 
do you have a sense of time frame when your consultants will have done the assessment and you have a general idea of economic feasibility as well as location? Yeah, one of the issues that we've been dealing with is, is data. You know, to really look at feasibility, you need data mm -hmm. and stuff. And so we have been working with DDS. We've been working with North Bay Regional. Mm -hmm. We've been working with Partnership Health Plan, that is the, the Medi-Cal service provider in Sonoma County to try to collect data. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the areas of, of a little <laughs> frustration that we have had is on the medical side in terms of really understanding, you know, where the, um, not only with regards to the SDC, um, clients, mm -hmm. but this center would broader. really serve the broader prop population. Mm -hmm. So that has been one of the, the, the frustrations with regards to the timing, but we have been moving forward on that. And with regards to the timing, we're looking at, um, with regards to the feasibility plan, maybe two to three months. Okay. Yeah, yes. months with months. regards to the feasibility. Thank you. Appreciate that. Will everyone have um, present their written testimony? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. We're going to ask for if uh, everyone can provide written testimony today as well. That would be fantastic. Anything else, Senator Lou? Senator Mitchell, um, just uh, piggybacking on Mr. Stroud. First of all, I really appreciate the count, and I know I'm biased. So uh, yes, just I am. Uh, but sincerely, the county has stepped up, mm -hmm. made this a priority willing to put some financial skin in the game to be able to make this work. Mm -hmm. uh, and to go what I think Mr. Moto was saying is, it's about putting the people first. With the understanding that there is this transition. Uh, and I think it, having been on these discussions, we have to hitch the wagon with the state on this vision. And that is why uh, I have been a bit of a, a dog on a bone about needing to be able to make some decisions um, and needing to be able to get the data to be able to move to ensure that uh, the locals can actually have the services lined up. Because while you may have your plan done in the next two or three months, it is gonna be a complicated financial formula that is gonna be, they're gonna need to pull the trigger on and that's gonna take longer uh, than the two or three months. No, absolutely. I was speaking to the, the feasibility plan that yeah. would be developed by our consultant. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm just sharing my own comments why we need to be able to make some decisions in the state to be able to start lining the resources up and to be able to provide those other vendors like a FQHC to be able to put pencil to paper, right? Yes, absolutely. So um, I, we'll, we'll keep pushing on that. Absolutely. You know, a key next step will be uh, moving forward, you know, sitting down with the state, sitting down with the regional center to discuss um, these programs. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then I have a, thank you so much, Mr. Stratt, a quick question uh, for um, Ms. Blakemore in regards to uh, the generic services that you're discussing. Can you give me a over under, um, and I uh, apologize, but just trying to get a ballpark for every 100 cases that it would be seen, how many do you think need specialized services besides IHS or the other option of IHSS? I, I don't know that I can give you a number, but it, it, it primarily applies in supported living as the best example I can give you of where, so it would be the number of individuals currently in supported living and some percentage of those, not everyone that lives in that living arrangement. 